welcome everybody, Ellen and everybody else. Um, thank you all for coming. My name is Susan Derwin. Uh, I'm the director of the Interdisciplinary Humanities Center. I'm a faculty member in German and Comparative Literature. Um, and we're delighted to see you all here at uh, the Humanities Decanted series, which is an informal space of ours in which faculty engage in conversation about their newest research and creative work. And this is one of our ancillary events and series, our principal, no less significant, and I dare say more pleasurable than many of our other events, but I mean, not our other events are very pleasurable, don't get me wrong, but uh, even more pleasurable. The, the pleasure just oozes out of this room for this event. But what I'm suggesting, this is all a, a sales pitch. We are circulating our mailing list, our sign-up sheet. So please do sign up so that you have um, notice of all of our events, including our public uh, lecture series this year, which is called TMI Too Much Information. And we have a very uh, dense and rich program, series of uh, programs, both in winter and spring quarter. So I hope to see you all here then. So um, before we get into it today, I do want to acknowledge the Chumash people, who are the traditional custodians of the land upon which the Interdisciplinary Humanities Center is located. And I would like to pay respect to elders, both past and present. So during our discussion, um, and as I said now for the eighth time, but it's in my script, so I'll say it again, please do enjoy snacks, which are on the side of the room. Um, and I'm going to get right down to it and say that it is my great pleasure to introduce today's humanities decanted interlocutors, Jody Enders and Leo Cabranes Grant. Jody Enders is an award-winning distinguished professor of French at UC Santa Barbara. She has written or edited and translated 10 books, and she has a new edited book forthcoming, The Norton Anthology of Rhetoric and Writing. At the moment, she's working, it may be finished, who knows, she's working on another manuscript, so prolific is she, Classroom Farces, a dozen more medieval French comedies in modern English for the stage. And today, she will be, be discussing two recently appearing volumes of medieval French comedies, which she both edited and translated. Professor Enders will be speaking with Professor Leo Cabranes Grant, uh, an alumnus, alumnus of Humanities Decanted, having spoke here last, having presented here last time. And Professor Cabranes Grant is from the Department of Spanish and Portuguese and Theater and Dance. His work includes a scholarly monograph as well as four books of poetry and a collection of award winning plays. So now we're going to begin with a short presentation by Professor Enders, followed by a 30-minute or so conversation. And then we'll open the floor to, uh, for questions to our audience and comments. So thank you both for being here. Thank you all for coming. And it's my pleasure to turn this over to Jody. Thank you. Thank you all so much for coming. All right. I have my timer on. I have public speaking students in the office. So, right, what have I done lately? Well, for about 15 years now, I've been living in the world of Middle French farce, a runaway hit in the 15th and 16th centuries. There are over 200 mostly anonymous plays that survive, and they're hysterical short, satirical verse takedowns written by a bunch of lawyer types. They skewered everything from religion to law to politics to teaching. And actually, that's where it all began for me, with teaching. I wanted to teach the stuff and see the plays performed. But there were maybe 11 translations out there, kind of hark, wife, wherefore dost thou complain kind of thing. So I started to wonder, how long would it take to maybe translate the farce of the fart? Turns out, not long at all to get the words down on the page. The hard part was capturing the magic of a theatrical experience where performance changes everything. What did it look like? What did it sound like? What did it smell like? Theater seemed to magnify all 
the translator's usual challenges in conveying not just the literal sense of the words, the slang, the dialects, the allusions to lost historical events, the pop culture. In farce, there was also all this music and singing and dancing, the breathless pace of the octosyllabic verse, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, don't have much time, it's just eight beats. And then the physical comedy, the mime, the slapstick, but rarely flagged in the stage directions. So I've actually been working on a taxonomy lately for why translating theater is different. But for today's seven minutes maximum, let me just say that if we want to do theater justice in translation, we need to learn to read between the lines for performance. By and large, it's fair to say that a medieval script is a blueprint, a code for a performance that's either already happened or is yet to come, a virtual performance. So to crack that code, the translator needs to imagine it live by becoming a kind of virtual dramaturge. What you need here is a kind of dramaturgy of the mind's eye, seeing the performance in your head and also a dramaturgy of the mind's ear, kind of like in poetry, hearing it too. Translating theater means reading what's not on the page and translating that. And there's the rub, because what you're translating in farce is in your face, sexism, violence, obscenity, sacrilege, you name it. Just to give you a few quick examples, here's what happens when theater asks, as it always does, that you picture this. In Slick Brother Willie from Immaculate Deception, a monk has to beat a hasty retreat from a married woman's bedroom. Mon Dieu, no time to grab that underwear. Whatever is a brother to do? The Middle French, by the way, was so graphic that the 19th century editor declined to print it. But I'll quote from my translation. I guess I'll just have to make a fist and take Brother Willie in my own two hands. Nature's jockstrap. But the thing is, rejecting the words doesn't come anywhere close to resolving the visual matter of what in God's name is happening on the stage. How do we get Willie off, off the stage? <laughs> How about this stunning stage direction from André Tissier, brilliant editor of 65 Farces. I quote, the monk makes a sketchy sign of the cross that degenerates into a caress of his groin area. <laughs> oh really? Mm -hmm. What do you suppose that looked like? If you're translating theater, you need a lot more than that seemingly perfect word or turn of phrase, le mot juste. You also need the right stage action, l'acte juste. Take a farce like Highway Robbery, a triumph of not so much wordplay as gestural play. The words on the page denote the unburdening of the soul that comes along with confession. The acts on the stage display a thief unburdening a priest of his purse. To borrow a line from the movie Ridicule, this might well be the jeu d'esprit of wordplay, but it's also a geste d'esprit, it's gesture play. So here's the thing then about a faithful, ethical, and creative translation of theater. With or without an extant script, theater is a vision of and for action. It's always translation. It's always adaptation. It invites interpretation and collaboration. Believe it or not, that's actually what makes it possible to transform this fine farcical mess into a feminist project. After all, reading for silence, reading for what isn't there is what launched feminist literary theory in the first place. Take my stage directions in Wife Swap that allow a female character to rebel her rebellion is in the text when she's ordered to fart, which I have her do, but I have her do it in the man's face because poof, 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 poof. That's a direct quote. That was only five farts. He asked for seven. And one last thing, a translation or interpretation that might seem to work against the apparent message of a text 
is perfectly consistent with what medieval manuscript illuminators did. Each and every time they decided to pepper the margins of religious texts with glorious images of, what else? Farting apes and couples having sex. So with all that in mind, I'll turn things over to one of my very favorite interlocutors of all time, Leo Cabranius Grant, who's also been a precious collaborator on this project from the get-go, although I do note that he is not in costume today. It's always a thrill to talk theater with him. There are a number of collaborators who've worked on virtual farces with me that I should thank, Gordon Abra, um, Wolf Kittler, Gisela Comorel, Ellen Anderson, Cappy Kaplan, Dan Jaffe. Um, I hope I haven't, if I forgot you, can you raise your hand? But thank you everyone so much for coming today. And I'll turn it over to Leo. And I won't start talking until so directed. Good afternoon. Thanks to all of you for being here. Um, I would like to start by uh, doing what they say, uh, what they call in TV, a full disclosure. Um, yes, I have participated many times in the readings of these translations when they were right out of the workshop of Professor Ender's mind. And it's in particular, during COVID, we kept doing those readings online. And you cannot imagine what a wonderful source of hope and enjoyment was to be revisiting this genre during COVID and finding so many reasons to laugh. So uh, I want to thank you for providing um, that, that opportunity to move on and go on in the middle of, of a very difficult time, um, which of course is one of the missions of theater in general and performance. And, and I would like also to mention um, it's something I feel and I think about your work as a medievalist. Uh, if you don't mind me uh, doing a short review of you, uh, be, be oh, I'm, you I'm talking. appalled. I, mean, I can't imagine. Uh, something that I really, I really enjoy and like about your work is that, you know, we are used to look back into the Middle Ages, and it had been done many times. The Romantics did it. The architects in New England in the 19th century did it. We look back to the Middle Ages, in you know, and get things like Game of Thrones, who is which is so medieval in many ways. But what I find very interesting about your work is that it's a looking forward to the Middle Ages. I mean, making it current. Uh, something I feel when I read your work is this, this fascinating feeling of I still have to catch up <laughs> with the Middle Ages. They are somehow ahead of me. They are somehow ahead of us. Um, and that's something that I think your work has done very consistently since the beginning uh, of, your, of your professional career. So in the context of that making it real, to quote Ezra Pound, uh, um, I mean, um, what does it mean to do translation, which is something you have not done before, something that have come uh, at this advanced stage in Thank your Thank you. In your <laughs> yes, in, in my old age, yes. We're going to do the riddle of this thing. Sorry, were you finished your? I don't know. Don't go yeah, yeah. Here. Why translation? Beyond that original impulse yeah. of really suspecting that my students, maybe some of them will tell you whether it worked or not, uh, I thought they would like it. And I thought that I would enjoy teaching it. And the more I delved into it, the more I started to find that it was stunningly modern, stunningly contemporary, stunningly postmodern, as wacko and open-ended as any Beckett play that you can imagine. And it was both startling and troubling to look back at the Middle Ages and think, could they really have been evolved, more evolved on, say, the subject of free speech? than we are. And it was issues like that that kept coming up time and time again. The other thing that I wound up bringing to the project was that I had started out in really serious, depressing, cruel, violent passion plays. 
uh, as a historian of rhetoric, trying to figure out what these guys were on about. What were, what were they trying to prove? Where did it come from? Why was it so violent? What did they mean to do? But it was only after having lived in that world for maybe 20 years that I started to understand what the comedy was rebelling against. And the other thing that happened in translation is that I felt, having embarked on the project, that I had actually never read anything carefully until I started translating it. I thought I was a really careful reader but performance changed everything. Yeah. Um, yeah, I know my response is getting kind of long. No, so. no, but what, okay. what, what, what I mean is, uh, I mean, as I was, uh, how much the translation supplements your scholarship, or how much your scholarship have defined the kind of translation translator you are? Couldn't have done it without it, but it really wasn't until talking to people who do theater and performance that I think I understood what it was all about. The kind of cleverness that one engages in with, oh, look at this open-ended play. What, what could possibly have happened? Clearly, there wasn't a miracle of the loaves and the fishes during the performance of this passion play in 1547. But it would have been impossible to stage something like that. And then there was a theater historian in the audience. I don't know if you remember Michael Zampelli, who's also a priest, who said, have you looked at how they did communion in the cathedral at Valenciennes. You want to distribute a bunch of communion wafers like that? And then I thought, oh, okay, I'm missing a lot. So it just moved me from the text to a whole audiovisual experience mm. that I had not embraced before. Uh, and you already mentioned the, the, the specific uh, uh, pleasures and also uh, the dangers of translating theater. Yeah. But I'm very interested in, in expanding on the fact that one of the reasons theater is so fascinating and at the same time so easy to miss is that so much of what is on the page is going to depend on how it is said, what kind of gestures the actor do, what kind of audience is reacting to it, and how as a translator you manage to integrate those almost inevitable gaps. Yeah. I mean, how do you know that that's exactly what they meant if it could have been changed? I have you know. no idea what they really meant. In fact, I feel pretty confident that some of these men would be rolling over in their graves <laughs> if they saw what I was doing to some of these things. But the question Leo asked is why I'm obsessing of late with this taxonomy. Uh -huh. Things that you actually have to make a decision about in translation. And I know you and I talked about this, but one of the most fascinating cases is a play that's super funny on the page, but it's a husband makeover, and it calls for two relatively nice husbands. Yeah, I know it's a stretch, right? Um, it calls for these two nice husbands <laughs> to be ushered into a giant oven for their makeover. And it's really funny on the page, but then you start to think about how can I possibly translate this visual material? It would be very difficult to imagine an oven on stage without conjuring visions of the Holocaust. So something has to happen to make this doable. Uh, I think in my translation, I suggest putting something easy bake oven or a child's toy on the stage. One possibility for that. And yeah, I mean, the other thing about that play is you can't have nice men emerge blackened and evil without conjuring visions of lynching. So being a translator of theater and bringing in that visual component means that you're going to have to come face to face with things where a contemporary meeting, a meaning will completely overwhelm any original medieval meaning. And that's just one example of visual material, which I, I think is, is helpful. The others we're more familiar with, intonation, things that completely alter what you mean. I just love talking to Leo. I just love talking to Leo. Okay. I mean, none of that <laughs> visible on the page. Um, 
Well, you know, uh, this I find very interesting, what you just said, because it, it seems to me, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems to me that it's not just about, in your case, it's not just about translating what's on the page, making it available for a contemporary audience, but also there is a lot of redress of the balance of power. Yes, there in the is. Gender issue, in the gender, for example, uh, situation, and also in other ways. So it's not just translating, it's re-accessing mm -hmm. to a certain extent. And I'll be honest, some translators might say that that's not what the translator maybe needs to be doing. But you seem to have embraced that so enthusiastically. Yes, I have. So, <laughs> you know, so I would like to understand better where that decision comes from, because as a translator, it's a, it's, I'm sure it's not an easy thing to decide that not only mm -hmm moving from one language to another, but also really recalibrating what is happening there. How, how, how do, I mean, what is that about? I think that some theorists of translation would probably disapprove of <laughs> what I am doing, as would the people that I am translating, to which I would respond they meant for this stuff to evolve. They meant for this stuff to, what do the British say, take the piss out of people, to mock people as far as it often takes the piss, literally. They really meant for it to skewer social institutions, hegemonies, politicians, people in power, and they were also pretty good at skewering themselves. So I say, if they want to skewer themselves in their work, which they often do, fine. I'll play along. You know what else I'm going to do while I'm at it? I'm going to name all of the female characters. Why not? Farce doesn't have a name. Uh, the names of most farces are along the lines of, if you ever watched Friends, it's the one with the four women and the schmuck, or the bookseller <laughs> with the two women. So if farce is going to create, I mean, farce filled those gaps each time it cast someone, each time it cast a man in drag. I'll have the same kind of fun with naming and with seeing. Which, which sounds appropriative. Yeah. So what? Yeah. Someone's going to ask me about so what during their, OK, bring it on. Right. Well, that's you in the, in the solitary labor of the translator desk. Mm -hmm. But then this has to come to the classroom. Oh, yes, it and does. And as you just mentioned before, and yes. I would like to know more about that because I find it fascinating, how you teach something that, by all means, we might find politically incorrect today. Uh, I mean, these texts are very much, very aggressive in certain ways that yeah, we, are. at the moment, might not condone. So um, how you put that in the classroom, and how you figure out how the students are going to get into this? Well, I would like to know, as a, as a professor myself. I will. I will tell you, um, other than approaching each time I do it with complete fear and trembling, wondering how it's going to go, um, there's at least one student in this room right now who survived that farce class and lived to tell the tale. So I more or less begin by telling them that like some of the comedies they enjoy today, this is a repertoire that's going to be in your face. It's going to feature violence, sexism, ethnocentrism, things that we find repellent. And it's going to do it in a way that we find extremely politically incorrect. That even if I wanted to give trigger warnings for everything you're going to see, in this repertoire, I couldn't possibly come up with all of them. It hits just about every button. It's there to make you uncomfortable. It's there to be in your face. But it's also there to suggest that you might be able to take away some kind of profitable social message or have a good laugh and forget it, which is something that's debatable. So what I do in the classroom as a medievalist is talk about obscenity and talk about language and context. Oh. And there's a great debate in the 13th century, for example, that's picked up in some of the farces about which is more obscene, the euphemism or the thing 
that is the natural body part. We know about this from people here are too young probably to know who Lenny Bruce is, but Kathy Griffin, um, stand-up comics who really push the limits. But what is more obscene, I'm trying not to use obscene language here at the IHC. Um, there's a play where Margot, played by Cappy Kaplan in one iteration, um, said that she saw a monk and he had this thing in his hands and it was kind of like a living sausage. And the priest says, what was it? A cock or ball, spit it out, woman. And so the play actually really spotlights is a body part out of context something to be feared? So we do a desensitization exercise. Mm. Something okay. that I learned when I took human sexuality at the University of Virginia as an undergrad. He had us put every filthy term we'd ever heard, and then we read them aloud, and we learned that those words didn't do anything to us, but we were also able to map out what we thought the limits of the language we were going to tolerate were going to be in the classroom. So that's what I try to do. So, so your classroom it's becomes scary. really like a, an HBO version of, 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 of this. I don't know. I asked no, them. no. I, 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 I asked that because I mean, I all of a sudden I realized there are some affinities between stand-up comedians and these farces, and I wonder if that's something that is, is part of your mindset when you are looking at them. Yeah. Well, I mean, I started out as a historian of rhetoric, interested in delivery, mm -hmm. and so this was all. I mean, there's nothing more rhetorical and hysterical these days than stand-up comedy, and the people that wrote these farces are lawyers. I mean, they're, they're highly learned, erudite men just trying to skewer the justice system, show their, well, show their own superiority to everyone, and make jokes about institutions that probably even most of the people in the audience wouldn't get. So they're inside jokes and jokes for the masses. So I sometimes have a student say, I, I feel excluded from uh, this humor because that character said a couple of words of Latin in the play. And yeah, that's kind of the whole point. They're making fun of us. One of the challenges in the new book is trying to figure out how to translate humor when it revolves around stupid people <laughs> speaking Middle French, pronouncing Latin with the wrong accent. I mean, this is France, right? I mean, have you ever been there and you ask something and they pretend that they don't understand what you're saying, right? You did not pronounce it uh, correctly. So that's what we're talking about. Is this, is this why there are so many uh, popular cultural references in your translations? Music, oh my God. I mean, even sometimes echoes of commercials and things like that. Yes. This is my blessing and my curse. I remember every song and every lyric I have ever heard. It makes up for the fact that I remember no numbers, no dates at any time. So it does mean, I mean, the, the stuff is full of call outs for popular songs. And I mean, there's one fantastic book about all the music in the French secular theater, but most of that stuff is gone forever. So I try and think, okay, what's the song that would perfectly fit this? And don't get me started on getting a lawyer to look at my use of the copyright symbol, uh, which is difficult. I had Mark Rose look at this for me, actually. For anyone that knows Mark Rose, he was absolutely invaluable in all of this. but. Uh, yeah, it needs a call out to a song, which also means that the translations are already way too old, way too dated the minute they come out. Because um, I'm not 20, uh, just in case you know you were wondering. And so, but my students understand this completely and are already substituting in other other songs, other references that I'm too decrepit to know about. I, 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 also, this is connected to cultural difference because I'm not 
and I'm, I'm not American, I was not raised necessarily with the same soundtrack no, uh, around my head that, that, that you were. So there is a cultural difference issue also, yep. how much a non-American breather of certain kind, and I'm not 20 either, obvious, obviously, um, I mean, will have access to this kind of popular echoes. I mean, I that's, that's a challenge in a way. It's a challenge, and it's one where I'm just not going to be able to do it beyond taking advantage of that extra textual space to say, here's what I suggest. I usually, you know, quote the uh, Magritte thing, and I say, ceci n'est pas un scénario. This is not a script. Right? Take it or leave it. Take it out. I had a really fascinating discussion with a uh, a woman in Glasgow who reviewed one of the books and she said, well, why do I need an American dictionary to understand all this slang? <laughs> and honestly, the best response I could think of was, well, I, I think that means I probably got it right for the translation I have in mind of how this particular repertoire can speak to us in this American moment that we're in, as long as it can adapt. And it always can adapt. All it takes is a different accent, a different setting. Mm -hmm. We see this all the time in theater. Let's stage it here. Let's do it in modern dress. Let's, let's do it in World War I. Yeah. So you, you count with directors be creative, as they should, and and yeah. retranslate your translation to a certain extent mm -hmm. to make it accessible for an audience that might not be as, as conversant with yeah. the American soundtrack, as I call it, um, uh, of your translation, yeah. which by the way is fascinating because, I mean, it's like just defining what is this referring to, which musical this is coming from, which song this is coming from, can be an absolute joy for, for the reader and for, and for the audience. Um, before we move to a QA, which we will have to do soon, um, I, I would like to go over one, one more thing, and it's that um, the physicality, the somatic richness of these texts. Um, how, you know, we are used to think about the Middle Ages through the lens of Bakhtin and the carnival, you know, as something that occasionally might go a little out of joint and out of control. Uh, these forces are out of control all the time, I mean, in, in so many ways. But I would like to see how is the relation with the medieval body and how this might help us, again, to rediscover the Middle Ages from a, from a different point of view. Mm -hmm. I mean, how do you address the somatic, how do you address the physicality, the very open references to basic functions of the body and basic parts of the body. Basic functions, yes, are pretty much in your face. Basic body parts. I'm actually, what I'm thinking about in, in response to your question is, is just how you'll get a middle French gag mm. that is clearly funny. I, I mean, this is going to sound super boring, but in the Middle French language, the male subject pronoun is routinely used to refer to women. I know that that sounds really weird, but when you imagine that that's happening on stage and you're pointing to a bunch of men who are playing women and you're saying il, it's not just a pronoun anymore. Yeah. Um, and one of the, it's not quite what you asked me about the body, but one of the characters in one of the plays in Immaculate Deception is clearly a kind of drag queen. Um, there are a number of historians who believe that um, the role might even have been played by a favorite jester that uh, came to contemporaneous with that farce. And I kept trying to figure out what this character was doing about what I was going to do with il and el. And then the thing that solved the problem is I started to refer to them and they, which seemed like, on one hand, a perfect translation of il, 
um, but then also made the play both historically faithful and remarkably contemporary in its sensibilities. Okay. So once you know that you have a body, every time some character is talking about bumping into somebody's breasts, I mean, it's farce, it happens. I mean, you have to imagine some insane costumed actor looking like a camped up version of what a woman is supposed to be. How much, how much do we know about the, uh, the audiences, oh, the that, audiences that were attending these things? We know that it's marketplace theater. There are very few um, surviving documents about performance at all. We tend to hear about a farce performance if people wind up in jail, which does happen uh -huh. because they insulted the king or they insulted the priest. So that's when we hear about it. But you can imagine it as marketplace theater. Um, it's simple. You just need a couple of actors with or without a raised platform. I've seen it done with just a broom for a prop, um, a place to sit, a place to stand, and you've got forest, and it's smack in the middle of everybody's daily life. It's often right in the public square in front of the church, so it really is in the clergy space, too. Okay, and, and how much do we need about the actors? Were they, were they trained in a particular way? Were they acting in other genres while doing these? So we do know that they're kind of, they're these lawyers and they, or lawyers in training. And so they're kind of upper middle class and well healed enough to be able to go to law school. Those are mostly the actors. We don't find, oh, it's on my cheat sheet somewhere. I told you about me and numbers, but we don't find the first actress um, in France doing comedy until the middle of the 16th century. Um, and that's in Uru. She gets hired for about 240 bucks a year to do acrobatics and farces and morality plays. So uh, yeah, but short of people being arrested or just happening to fall on some letter where some kid writes to his mom or dad and says, oh, guess what I saw the other day? There's, there's very little evidence these perform. We do know, though, that people really liked them because these are some of, well, there are over 200 of them, and they are some of the first works that attracted some of the very first book printers. So they were printing these farces like crazy in four major collections. And they sold well, I mean, uh, that I don't know. Full for the time. That I don't know. Okay. That almost sends me into, you know, numbers land. And even <laughs> if I knew at some point, this is why I'm a literary person and not a historian. Okay. Okay. They didn't think that was funny. I apologize. <laughs> Wait, I think I think this is a good moment to open it to a com to a wider conversation. And, um, that would be fun. Then I'm going to put on my glasses. I so have. You have questions? Just raise your hand. We'll bring you a mic. Thank you so much for coming, everybody. Thank you. Um, I was wondering about the authorship of these plays mm -hmm. for access to like um, corpuses like the fabula. Corpuses like the fabula. Fabu uh, my French is terrible. Oh, fabula. I'm, sorry, I, fabula. I'm, just, I'm giving a demonstration of uh, the obnoxious French person of the fabliau. <laughs> Is oui. that what he said? We. Oui. Oh, and it's uh, she. She, sorry. Um, yes. Um, so you're asking about whether or not there's a linkage um, between. Yes. We. Oui. Oui. J'ai compris. Thank you for the question. Yes, yes, and yes. Um, also, tons of Boccaccio. Um, so there's a lot of conversation between. Uh, between uh, the question is about these pretty early dialogic, short, funky verse narratives, Fablio, um, 12th century. They're 
poems, right? So they have tons of dramatic potential. They're full of voices of different characters, so it's easy to make that imaginary step and imagine someone doing voices. Reading meant reading aloud in the Middle Ages. Um, this has always been my theory about part of Rabelais. If you've ever read any Rabelais, there are tons of lists. And when people first encounter these lists, they're like, well, what is that all about? I think that they were performed. I think that they were performed with gesture. Yeah. Um, so yes, um, there are a couple of farces where there's maybe a direct correlation. But it's quite a few centuries that have gone by. So similar in spirit, uh, different in performance. Thanks. Merci. Uh, je vous en prie. <laughs> je vous en prie. Uh, what's your name again? We met that one time. My name is Alice. All right. I know this lady. Hello, Zoe. Hello. Thank you for such a wonderful talk. Thanks for coming. <laughs> I had a question um, relating to your comment about the reviewer and the American slang book. I was just wondering if you ever envisioned your work as sort of a stepping stone for other translators, or rather just an example for them to incorporate and have their oh. own interpretation? Uh, yeah, I think I just, I just imagined that it's a tough thing in theater because there's a real sensitivity to, to making any changes whatsoever in an author's script without the express permission of the author. So the way I've dealt with it is kind of akin to how I'm reading farce with an invitation to say, have a way. I think the magic of this kind of comedy is that it is what we say in the theater department, it's site specific. It's a very particular comic message for a very particular group at a very particular time. And yeah, it's what I said to the reviewer. And I, I think it probably means I got it right. Have a way, British it up. Uh, I, I wrote one British character in one of the plays in Farce of the Fart. I, don't have the same, it's, I mean, that's the most popular of the books. I think it's the book in which I'm not the translator that I am now. Um, I think I've become a better translator. My middle French, by the way, has gotten really good. But yeah, uh, I just, uh, I, I don't think that my British accent for the character sounded authentic, just because I knew the word knackered. Thank you. Thank you. And I know this, I know this gentleman and the gentleman before. Hi, Giancarlo, thank Hi, you for Jody, coming. Hi, Jody, thanks so much for that. I'm really looking forward to getting the material in person. Um, it sounds fascinating. I wanted to come back to this question of um, feminist translation slash interpolation that, that you I talked about. I had a about. feeling you might, yeah. <laughs> um, and I was just wondering, um, yeah, how did you strike that balance between transforming the sexism and keeping it intact, which in a sense yeah. is part of, as you were saying, yeah. part of its force and shock value. And yeah. did, you, did you diminish the sexism? Did you accentuate it? Uh, what was the strategy for dealing with that? Uh, it's multiple strategies dealing with multiple kinds of events. But I think an example I can give you that will sound less appropriative um, is a case in a play called Wife Swap, where we know that two men, you thought this was just reality TV. No, there is a 15th century play about the two husbands swap their two wives. And you can tell at the end, at the denouement, there is this big debate. No, I'm staying with him. No, I'm staying with him. No, he's mine. No, she's mine. No, that, but we have no idea, because there are no stage directions, who the hell they are talking about. Pardon my French, right? So this is an example where I'm invited by a script to do what any theater practitioner is invited to do, to interpret. And one of the things that my students have done for that particular play, I wrote upwards of 10 endings. 
just to figure out, okay, these are all the possibilities. And when my students staged that one, they liked the queer ending. I thought it would be really nice if we did one where the two women wound up together. Nothing in the text ruled it out. So it sounds like something that would be unimaginable, but it's not when you consider the attitude of these particular comedians and everything they're doing, everything they're communicating. So uh, that's the kind of fun it's possible to have, and I think still be faithful yeah. to the original. Great. Okay, thank you. Thank you for coming, Carla. Yes, Jody. Um, you know, I'm going to ask you this. When we think of comedy, of course, French comedy, we think of Moliere. Yes, and I was wondering if you could put this in the context. How was Moliere influenced by these farces? Uh, and was he? Was there any direct or any bits that he took? Or was he just influenced by the Commedia? Boy, uh, yeah, tough one. When I read Moliere now, having been in this repertoire, okay, on one hand, the feel of Alexandra, Alexandra the 12th, it's also beautiful and proper. We know that there was Commedia. There's a whole school, as an influence, there's a whole school of French theater scholars who will swear to you up and down on a stack of Bibles that there's absolutely no connection between farce and Commedia dell'arte. I actually don't believe that. I think I might have even found a smoking gun in a chronicle. But we know also from a grad student in our department, Aria Dalmolin, who did a dissertation about the movement between France and Italy. So was Moliere reading farces? I, I kind of doubt it. Um, I'm not a, not a classicist anymore. At one point, I thought I might be. But certainly there are commonalities, right? He's working with these types, which are all over the place in farce. They're just a little more, what do we say, lowbrow uh, in the farce. You're not going to find a, the raisonneur, for example, in farce, the guy that is always a guy sorry, that comes forward to reason with everyone. They're all unreasonable. Oh, another question. W would would uh, Roman comedy be an influence on these farces? You so know, like the pot Roman of gold. Comedy? Yeah, Roman comedy, like the, f you know, Moliere was influenced by Plautus' pot mm -hmm. of gold to write mm -hmm. the avar, el avaro in Espanol. There, there's extensive Roman influence to the extent that, their rhetoricians. So they're not reading theater as much as they're engaging in mock trials and debating wacko cases the way you would see in moot court. Some of these cases are disgusting, but it's sort of how young men cut their teeth to become law students. So. That's really what they're drawing on. The plays are really legalistic. Um, it's one of the things that attracted me to the repertoire. I'm like, why are they all litigating their proverbial asses off? And that's the world they're coming from. It's very different from English drama, say, where my colleagues in English are still all excited about the second Shepherd's play. Um, but we have 200 farces or more over across the channel. I don't know. Maybe the Brits don't have a sense of humor. I don't know. What do you think? What do you think? I, <laughs> Um, oh yes, well I, I goaded, I goaded Heather Blurton into, yeah, that play is so not funny. <laughs> Thank you, Jody. this is fun, but of course I've asked you this before, but maybe now you've had more thoughts, so why is there no English farce? Sorry, it's hard for me to understand. But why is there no medieval English farce? 
Oh, you're asking me from across the, they're too bloody English. No, no, sorry, I don't mean that. Um, why is there no medieval forest from what I? Well, I guess maybe a different way to phrase it is, it, is there something so specific about the legal culture yeah, that's going so. on in this moment that? Yeah. I think so, yeah. Um, I. Oh, I say this every time I talk about this material. Somebody really ought to write a dissertation about this. But it's so different. And from what I've been given to understand, the the sites in England are these community guild-sponsored, um, almost, I mean, to me, it almost looks like a patronage type model, a very different approach to what the value of theater, serious or comic, can be to a given community. And the French attitude, especially from a bunch of lawyers, is you think you've got a community? Well, let's have a debate about what a community really is. Have I got something to show you? You think this is worthy of a trial? Let me fart in your face. Uh, you think, I mean, one of the most interesting things, I mean, I'm wondering from your question, uh, is whether or not these plays were in their time completely socially conservative, completely hopelessly retrograde. I would like to believe that that is not the case. Um, I think that any art form that got people to turn out in droves, that got printers interested in printing their stuff, that had to pass muster with a censor that people believed could do some good. I, I don't think it's fair to the genre or to the medium to say nothing good could have come out of this. Laughter and social conscience are not mutually exclusive. And that, um, sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, in fact, when I teach this stuff, my students are always bringing it. Oh, have you seen this? Have you seen that? Have you seen that? Um, I wandered a bit from your question, but um, it does seem stunning that there are 200 of these things and, and so few over in England. I'll let someone else take that one. I know her. So I have a two-part question sure. about audience in general. Oh, yes. Two, but two different audiences. Mm -hmm. So, um, Leo, you would mention that so much of performance depends on audience response, sort of the energy, the what, I mean, I'm assuming you meant that, sort of the interaction. Yeah. Yes. So my question, Jody, is um, when you're doing the work of translation and repurposing, let's say, mm -hmm. um, are you the audience? Like, who are you the audience? Which audiences are you? Are oh you the medieval audience? Mm -hmm. Are you the contemporary? Like, where are you as both the um, translator of the playwright? And you said you have to imagine all of this, but yes. where do you sit mm -hmm. metaphorically? That's my first question. Okay. And the second question is how do you? Uh, anticipate and um, the audience for your books. Who is your audience? What would you like mm, okay. to see? What would you like to come out of this? Do you anticipate okay. staging, a new yes. kind of dialogue? Is there something yes. about comedy and transgression? Like, what are your mm -hmm. hopes for your, re your mm -hmm. readers, your audience? Mm -hmm. so to, to In a way, that the second one is is easier to take on. The first one is more fun. Uh, the, my sense of audience has completely changed. Uh, the first two books, well, the first three books actually came out in a series for medievalists. And so it was for medievalists. Uh, all the footnotes had to be there. It all had to be there at the beginning because there was no, there was no real secondary there wasn't a tradition of textual criticism for this stuff. There was a lot of work to be done. But then I, I, I wanted the stuff to come to life. I felt like I 
wanted to transplant this universe to another universe where it could still be funny. So I imagine undergraduates. I imagine regular people who like under, uh, no, my undergrads are regular people. The irregular people are me, right? So I, I imagine people that like comedy. I imagine theater troops that want to try something that they haven't seen before. And I found that the books were being overwhelmed by what the medievalists needed. So I think I did my job for the medievalists, and now I'm talking to the theater people and the teachers. Who am I in the translation? Well, so my husband is here, so he's probably thinking, uh, oh, she's the flippin' actress. She would never show. So part of me is the actress, right? So I, um, I, I just. I've had friends tell me, so is that character you? Uh, sometimes it is like the really in your face, bitchy woman, that, that's me. Um, it's easy to imagine. <laughs> but where am I? I mean, I am 100% faithful to the extent that it, it is discoverable to the literal meaning of every single word of that middle French. Um, even if it, you encounter a word that's only used once, a hapax, and there are one or two of those in, in, um, in forests where you can't find a dictionary definition. It's the only time the word appears. So I am that person, and I get a huge kick out of imagining all these, um, whoa, when did they do this, 16th, 17th, 18th, 19th century uh, people that compiled the dictionaries for us. Now, let's see the word. I, I can't even say the words right here at the IHC, but I'll look up. You have to imagine these men in their coats and ties. Say, and the way we translate hoo-ha is, uh, so they're, they've glossed all of these words. So I am there, and then I'm also trying to imagine how was this heard by the women in the audience? How was this heard by, did they recognize this priest? Um, because the Franciscan monks were everywhere, not just in bars. We sometimes know that there are tight connections between actors and the roles they play. We see priests on stage, not so much in forests, but the, the actors are your friends. So I wanted to know who they were. There's this great incident where these two women get into a fist fight during a farce performance because one of them booed the husband and said he wasn't doing a very good job. So who are they? Who's watching? What are their expectations? And then what the hell can we do with it today? What am I going to do with this violence? abuse that is absolutely not funny. And what I normally resort to is a kind of three stooges. You just, it's a way of making the violence unreal. Sorry. Uh, yeah, two examples. One was a recent staging that I saw of Husband Swap where it was almost a simple matter, but this sort of Anna Nicole Smith-like character is all of a sudden talking about what her life is like at home, and things take a very serious turn. And she says, my husband would follow me, and then he'd beat the shit out of me. That director, a guy called David Beach, just cut out that moment from the entire performance darkened the whole theater, hit her with a power spot, took her out of time, and then went back into time. For some of the violent things, I wind up suggesting you cannot possibly stage this abuse, but it can look like bad fight choreography. Three Stooges, which I don't happen to like, but we've all seen this kind of violence in cartoons, right? If you watch the Wiley Coyote Roadrunner show, right? I mean, it's not very pleasant to have a boulder drop on your head and be flattened. So I think the way I deal with that is by transforming them into cartoons. 
who are unable to inflict real harm. Yeah. And my colleague has a question. Thank you for coming, Eric. Yeah, I was actually uh, hoping to circle back to Heather's question. About, yeah. And, uh, and, and speaking as someone who is known a lot of very funny British people, um, <laughs> it's, I, I wonder Monty if uh, it's not a, a matter of what gets written down and coming out of this lawyerly uh, community, they were more likely to write down their text and maybe, you know, there's, a, there's a, an English tradition that's closer to the oral tradition, something along those lines. Hmm. Um, I can't speak to England and would, would um, yield to my distinguished colleague, but one of the most fascinating things about what's going on in France is that we're smack in the middle of what a lot of us learned was a neat chronological divide between Middle Ages and Renaissance. And so we are still with a thriving oral tradition of medieval stories that could easily have been acted out and written down later, as you're suggesting, by people who are skilled writers. But we're also entering a moment with the rise of print culture where there's some evidence to even suggest that those behind the marshalling together of all the words for print are even thinking about things like censorship and even thinking about things like, well, who are, what, what Susan just asked me, <laughs> who are our readers? What do we want to tell them? So in France, it's, it's really both because we have stories that are much, much older, 15th century, being written down, maybe ad hoc, maybe post hoc, printed later. <coughs> Improv, right? I mean, we'll never find any of that stuff. I'm not sure I imagine a bunch of medieval British people doing improv, but maybe, maybe they do, maybe they don't. Uh, as, as we, I think we approach the, the, we do? the, the closure of the... Of By talking about England? That yeah. can't be. No, 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 no. no. no England. I want to get... No, I let's want to get, end with strength, for God's sake. I want to get <laughs> personal at the, at the end. Personal? By asking oh. how much of a... How much of translation has allowed you to express a hidden oh inner playwright? Are you coming out of the closet really? as a playwright by translating this play? Oh my god. You, I mean, I, I don't know if anyone other than my dear friend is interested, but this is the part of me that always wanted to do art that didn't think I had my own stories that I could write to tell. This is the part of me that's the filmmaker's daughter that thought, oh, my siblings got the visual gene that I didn't get it. I think I got it. Um, and yeah, it's, it's, it's the part that yeah, just really wants to create and not just write about. Most of us literary people get into this biz because we love the stuff, but creating this stuff gives a whole different picture. And yes, we humanists, we professors, of course, hate talking about ourselves. That was a real, <laughs> real stretch for me. <laughs> OK. Well, I, I would like to thank the uh, Interdisciplinary Humanity Center and all the wonderful people that have to so make this much. event. And Susan. Thank you so much. And thank you all. Thank you all so much for coming. Yes, thank you. Thank you.